All right, so E3 is in full swing, and uh, we're gonna talk about it now. The only frustrating thing I think, on, think honestly about the AMD launch is the fact that they're doing it in such like segments. It's like Summit Computex, well actually Summit CES, Summit Computex, Summit E3 with availability in July. So it's kind of like, come on, just, just, just pour it out. Let us have it, let us have all this goodness. Yeah, we're gonna talk about it. We're talking about their new processors. Uh, the 3950X has finally been debuted, and we're gonna talk about their new RDNA technology on their graphics cards, and their Navi architecture has finally been, uh, well, unveiled. So let's go and talk about it. Corsair is proud to present their new Hydro X line of custom water cooling products. The new XG5 series radiators offer the perfect balance of fin density and airflow to keep your loop cool and quiet. The XG7 water blocks feature full coverage cooling for your GPU while also maintaining an aesthetically pleasing design, while the XC7 and XC9 CPU blocks keep all your modern CPUs nice and cool. To see the complete lineup of HydroX cooling products from Corsair, click the link in the description below. All right, so um, we're just gonna kind of go through processors quickly because I think there was a little bit less shown on processors than the new graphics card, which is obviously, well, new graphics card family, which is obviously everyone's favorite uh, exciting thing because we know that the CPU side has been competitive now from AMD for several years. It's the GPU side of things that has been kind of like eh and lackluster. It's they have had a hard time getting the momentum going in my opinion. But the 3900X, we've, we've seen uh, obviously some of the teases and stuff about it, we finally started seeing some performance figures. Now, as you should with any company, whether it be in Intel, Nvidia, or AMD, you need to take these figures with a grain of salt. You need to see and wait for independent testing. You need to watch a bunch of different sources to kind of form a median performance figure. Um, I mean, everyone tests differently. So AMD obviously wants to put their best foot forward, so you want to be leery of that. Don't get caught up in hype trains and stuff. Wait for independent testing. Unfortunately, that's not gonna be until July. But the 3900X, which is the 12 core, 24 thread part, which is designed to compete directly with Intel 7920X, which is an X299 part on extreme platform. Remember the 3900X is on mainstream running dual channel RAM and the Intel is running quad channel RAM. They are boasting a 14% uptick in IPC versus 2000 series uh, Ryzen or, or last series Ryzen. So, which is obviously based on you know the first gen Ryzen, even though it was not an 1800 series or 1800X, 2700X, that's the same architecture we're now seeing in Zen 2. So we're seeing a 14% IPC uptick, which means that um, it's putting it pretty much in line directly with Intel in terms of IPC. And we're seeing faster clocks across the board. We still don't know yet exactly how many cores boost up to the up to 4.7 or 4.6 gigahertz. Um, but if all the rumors hold true, this is excellent because the 3900X with 12 cores, 24 threads is showing that it's com it, it's trading blows with the 9900K, which is kind of always been. And, and I know a lot of you right now are like, well, wait a minute, the 900K only has eight th eight cores. Wait a sec. The 9900K has always been touted as like the ultimate gaming CPU because of high IPCs, high clocks, which means less bottlenecking, better latency, and all those things which give you a better gaming experience. Usually the higher core count CPUs do not give you as good of a gaming experience because of multi-threaded uh, performance and you know leveraged CPUs and all that sort of thing. And this is showing us that it is trading blows between the 9900K when it comes to gaming. It, it, depending on the title, you could see a couple percent improvement uh, of AMD over Intel and vice versa. So if we're seeing it competing with the ultimate gaming CPU, but also if you look at the multi-threaded performance against the 7920X in productivity, where it's beating it pretty much across the board, well, if these figures hold up and all the independent reviewers see the same ex experience, you're gonna have a $1,000 CPU being beaten across the board by a $499 CPU. So that's exciting, especially if the fact that we're seeing it in productivity outpacing the 7920X with half the memory channels, well, then that makes it uh, that much better because you don't have to spend twice as much on memory and you're still getting a better overall experience. We also saw the 3950X being debuted, which obviously has 16 cores and 32 threads, which is interesting because that now puts it directly competing with last-gen Threadripper on mainstream platform for significantly less, $749 to be exact. So yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, and we have to wait till September for that unfortunately. The 3900X will be available in July, I think July 7th. 
But not only is it running on the X570 platform, we're running PCIe Gen 4, which we've already talked about, giving you uh, good improvements in I.O. in terms of your RAID cards and M.2 drives and any sort of PCI Express, not necessarily graphics card, but things that can saturate that type of bandwidth. Uh, you're gonna see up to 42% faster SSD performance. I mean, across the board, this is just insane in terms of what we're seeing here. The fact that we're seeing the next gen product in terms of PCI Express and all that sort of stuff being launched on an AMD platform and not Intel shows that the, the tides have certainly shifted. Now we're gonna, oh, and also too, the 3900X has 70 megabytes of cache and 40 PCIe lanes with PCIe Gen 4 and all that sort of stuff. So that's pretty mind boggling. You guys have seen the other guys talking about the motherboard quality at Computex. Usually you would see Intel motherboards having a better build quality and AMD was kind of like eh, even though they may have shared the same name like Strix and Strix or you know like a, uh, the um, Oris card versus, or motherboard versus another Oris motherboard. They just didn't have the same quality between them. Now we're talking about build quality on AMD motherboards outpacing and being better build quality than the Intel counterparts. It's kind of insane. But moving on to graphics because that's where AMD has always sort of lacked for quite a long time. They brought back the XT family and they're doing that obviously with the Navi architecture, the new RDNA, um, basically giving us a new mainstream graphics card, but it's not higher performance than Radeon 7, which I think is a, uh, gonna be disappointing to a lot of people because of the fact that when CES came out and we talked about uh, around that time, the 590 and all that stuff being the, the mainstream card that was only competing with like a 980 or something like that, or 980 Ti, I think it was. A lot of folks when RTX came out were saying, wait for Navi, wait for Navi, wait for Navi, wait for Navi. Unfortunately, this is not the Navi everyone was hoping for. And it's looking like AMD is still staying with that mantra of competing with the mid-range market. So for instance, the 5700 XT, which I, I think it's cool that they brought the XT name back. It's kind of a throwback to the original Radeon days where everything was XT and all that. Um, it's directly competing with an RTX 2070. And it's got eight gigabytes of GDDR6, so it's not running uh, HBM2 like a lot of people were thinking it was going to. Um, that's still Radeon 7 based on Vega architecture, or, uh, GCN or like a, you know, ultimate GCN architecture or whatever you want to call it. So if you were, which is competing with directly with a 2080. So NVIDIA is still all by itself up there in the major leagues in terms of 2080 Ti performance and all that sort of stuff. You're not going to see any uh, competition coming from AMD occupying that price point. But does it, I mean, that's kind of a ridiculous price point to begin with. Most people don't need that type of, of uh, graphics power. Now the new shroud that they're showing, and this is pretty obvious that it's going to be a, a board partner card because people are going to come out, obviously board partners are going to come out with multi-fan coolers, you know, vapor chambers and heat pipes and all that sort of stuff. Sticking with the gaming lines you're used to from all of your favorite board partners. Um, I like the way the new shroud looks. A lot, there's a lot of controversy on the dent, the dent looking weird. I just like the fact that it's something a little bit different thrown in there. I like the sort of um, corduroy look to it. Apparently there's a 50th anniversary edition where it, with Lisa Sue's like signature on it and like gold trim and all that sort of stuff. Just totally unnecessary, but I mean, if you're a huge fan of AMD, you'd probably be interested in that. But the 5700 XT and the 5700 are designed to compete with the 2070 and the 2060. Now they did all the figures here at 1440p gaming, which is a lot, I saw a lot of people in the comment section on the live stream sort of commenting like, well, of course they're not doing 1080 because it just shows that their CPU suck. Well, no, if you want to truly stress a graphics card, you need to put the load on the graphics card and you do that with higher resolutions. And 1440 makes sense because 4K gaming is still such a, a small adoption rate in the, in the industry. Uh, I think 1440 was the perfect sweet spot. But I think this was perfect because at the $449 price point, you're getting a 225 watt TDP card using, uh, you know, obviously TSMC's seven nanometer Navi arch architecture. And uh, it's looking like it's beating the 2070 fairly across the board with a couple of like Shadow of the Tomb Raider. It looks like the 2070 was still beating it, um, but you're seeing anywhere between a 2% to a 22% FPS game, raw FPS across the board um, on various titles. And they tested everything from Far Cry to Tom Clancy to The Division. Um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, kind of a weird title, but I guess AMD title, right? So we saw a huge um, overall improvement over the 2070 at a the same price point. So that's a, that. That's one thing worth talking about. But there's another 
parts of this I want to talk about in just a sec. If we look at the 2070 or the 5700, which is compared to the RTX 2060, um, it's anywhere from a 2% to 21% improvement across the board. And we'll put the same charts up that they showed. Again, wait for independent testing because we've seen these types of charts before and then we find they're very unique circumstances where these uh, tend to make sense. But both cards are featuring eight gigabytes of GDDR6, which is interesting because the 5700 compared to the 2060, 2060 only has six gigs of GDDR6. So you're getting more VRAM and with that you're getting, um, well, better performance across the board. But I can already hear the NVIDIA fanboys out there screaming, but it doesn't have Tensor Cores, and it doesn't have RT Cores. Well, I guess this is where you get to have a fun opportunity to, to, for choice, because it's one of those things where if you wanted to compete with NVIDIA, AMD didn't have anything until Ju July of this year, because 590 was the best you could get, and that didn't come anywhere near competing with the 2000 series, whether it be a 26 year up. Well, now at the same price point, you get that option. Do you want raw performance? which is what you can get with, uh, um, obviously with the, the 5700 and 5700 XT, or do you want the extra features that could potentially be adopted in the future more widely, but at the huge FPS tax that RTX and real-time DXR is, or ray tracing is gonna cost you. So this is where if you want the pretties, I guess you go with an NVIDIA card. If you want the performance, just no matter what, then you get the AMD card. Because if you go in the NVIDIA card and you just disable it all the time, then technically you get better performance with the AMD card. And, and there's a couple new functions that we still want to test here internally because um, they're, talk they're talking about anti-lag, which is supposed to improve the uh, lag between your monitor and your graphics card. When they said anti-lag, I immediately thought of like Fast and the Furious and I'm seeing in my brain like Supras are out there on two-step and they're just... <laughs> so I really want to know exactly how that works. Um, but yeah, there was zero mention of, of real-time ray tracing, which I found kind of interesting considering the fact that Navi's architecture is running on the next generation game consoles and they specifically mentioned real-time ray tracing for the consoles. And Lisa Su's um, keynote even started with, we love the PC space, we love the PC platform, that is where our passion is and stuff. And she talks about that, but zero mention of ray tracing there. So maybe this is where we're waiting for potentially a new flagship card to replace Vega that could potentially then compete with that high-end NVIDIA price point as well as give you that real-time ray tracing. Or maybe they're doing what a lot of people think NVIDIA should have, which is just, okay, you made this thing and it works, now improve it internally before you release it to the public so you get the frames that people want and the, obviously the real-time ray tracing. So I feel like with the graphics side of things, a lot of folks are disappointed because they really were expecting in, in, or AMD's Navi to just bring it. But where they're bringing it is where most people are shopping, if you wanna know the point. $200 and $500 is where most people spend their money. Most people spend that money closer to the $200 range. And I'm curious as if we're gonna see a uh, RDNA graphics card in that $200 to $359 price point, although we've got a $349, right, $5,700. So yeah, still a lot to wait for, a lot to learn but we don't uh, have that much information yet on exactly when these cards are gonna be available. Um, yeah, so anyway, just another piece talking about some of the news that's out there. You guys probably already heard this information. You're going, Jay, this is redundant. Why are you talking about it? Well, I've got my audience. I'm still obligated to talk to you about this sort of stuff. This is why we have this channel, so that we can talk about this sort of stuff. But in July, we're gonna obviously be talking about the new graphics, or the uh, new CPUs and doing some tests on that. And I'm, I'll tell you what, Skunkworks is currently running a 16 core processor. Uh, it's running a 7960X. And if we see the 16 core 3950X beating the 7960X, it makes me kind of want to switch that computer back to AMD for the hell of it, considering that's how this channel started was with an AMD rig of mine. I'm just curious as to how Intel's gonna answer. So, all right guys, sound off in the comments below on how you feel about the uh, new lineup of CPUs now that we've seen pricing and what the actual performance, at least according to their chart, stacks up, and with these two new graphics SKUs from AMD. I, I, I am positive there's more graphics cards coming out in the future. You can't have a family that re resides in only two different SKUs. You've got to have more than that, above it and below it. I'm hoping we'll see something come out that truly compares with the 2080 Ti. I'd love to see some real-time real -time ray tracing stuff come from AMD because I'm a nerd. I love the graphics. And so I wanna see that and I wanna see it represented on both sides. But uh, ultimately the buyers are the ones that determine how these companies uh, sort of shift their, their focus. So sound off in the comments below on what you guys think about the new leaks. 
hopefully you guys won't uh, hear anything about this until we actually have parts in hand that are ready to show you in the beginning of July. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.